so we're going to start with a bit of audience participation now. Would you like to have a quiz? Yes! You don't have a choice, so here we go. Here's my quiz. Now, um, I, I thought, I was trying to think of something topical. Uh, my name's Fred Billy, and I work at the University of Southampton in, in the School Liaison Office, and uh, we go around and, and chat to students and, and, and talk to them about university courses and places, and, and, and that's really, I guess, where your, your sons and daughters are at the moment. So what I thought we'd do is have a little quiz and see what you know already about university. So what, what we're going to do is have a game of University Pointless. Now, I don't know if, you, if you've seen the game Pointless, but uh, what you have to do is find the most pointless answers. So let's see if you can find the most pointless university. So here, we, here I've chosen from the Guardian Good University Guide. It's a big, big league table that's just come out a couple of weeks back. Um, seven universities at, uh, at random. And what I'd like you to do is that seven there. Yeah. What I'd like you to try and do is find uh, find the most pointless. Who who came top? And who who who, who was who was ranked the ranked the lowest? Okay. Having a talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> start looking at league tables, and, and they're helpful to a certain extent, but it's, I think, important not to obsess about league tables, because they all measure different things, and, and you, sir, made, made a point, top of what? And uh, uh, to compare all the 150, 200 universities in the UK just in one league table is, is, is a bit fatuous, because they're all measuring different things. Down at subject level, they can be helpful. But, uh, but there's a lot more to choosing a university just than looking at, uh, at a league table. And hopefully, your, your sons and daughters are thinking at the moment about, well, what is it they want to get out of the university experience? And um, folks like me who work in university admissions, when we talk to students, we, we tend to ask them, well, you know, what, what is it you want out of the university experience? Because for some students, it isn't right. It, it's time to leave school and get out into the world of work. But for, for many students from, from a good school like this, it, it is the next step. And uh, there are some helpful things, I think, that students can be thinking about. So, uh, what sort of subject, what kind of course they want to study, um, where they'd like to go in the UK, the independence and freedom. Th this idea about, well, it, it's a big step, you're making an investment in the future. Um, obviously, there's the, there's, there's the other part of, of university uh, life. Um, and, and, it, and it's exciting, and hopefully it's going to set them up to, to, to have a very successful job and career afterwards. But to, to get to that point, I think there are some helpful questions that students can be thinking about now. And I thought I'd maybe go, go through some of those with you today, if, if that's alright. Because I think they can help students make an educated choice. So here are some of the questions. You, you might be having these discussions at home at the moment. Um, first up, how far away would you like to go and study? And I wanted to share with you a, a couple of stats and a, and, a, and a couple of pieces of research. So um, last year, how, how far do you think the average distance in miles was as a student went off to university? 
Well, well uh, obviously, everybody applies for a UCAS, so we know this sort of stat. But last year, the average distance that a UK student went to go to study at university was about 50 miles. So, not, not that far. You would have thought it was, a, somebody said 60, not, not far off. And um, m many students now are quite regionalised with their choice. Where we are, are here in Bromsgrove, there's many good universities around us. But what I wanted to maybe suggest is sometimes students who choose a course just based on its geographic location are doing themselves a disservice. They're not choosing the course that best suits their uh, abilities. And there's been some research done by the Times Higher and by Newcastle University. And it looked at how far students travelled and how well they did in terms of the course that they chose and their career path. And what it found is that students who, who move further away tend to do better than those who, who stay locally because um, they've chosen a course that best suits their abilities. So the, the, the point that I would, uh, I'm making here really is that uh, it's a good idea for students to look at courses all over the UK at, at this point and then discount them later on rather than just draw concentric circles around, around Bromsgrove. Also, the research found that students who migrate, the, the further away they move, are more likely to earn more than those who stay in their <coughs> region. And that's kind of obvious if you think about it, because once they've cut the apron strings of, of home, they're more likely to move to find suitable employment or a graduate job, <coughs> not only in the UK, but, uh, but all around the world. So how, how far away uh, would they want to study? Here's another question. What should you study at university to get a good job? That's a bit awkward, so here you go. <laughs> here, here I've got uh, four subjects that we uh, teach at Southampton. English, Spanish, Geography, and Accounting and Finance. And all universities now ha have to complete something called a Delhi survey. It, it's what we call a destination survey. And what it does, it, it tracks what graduates are doing six months of leaving the institution they went to. And one of the things I, I suggest you, you, you might want to have a look at is the Delhi surveys, the destination surveys for each of the universities your son or daughter is applying to because they're very revealing. They, they basically tell you how many students have gone there, got a degree and got a job. At my university, about oh, over 90% of our students are in a, in, a, in a job or further study six months of leaving us. About 74, 75% are in a graduate level job, so that's in terms of salary, earning above 23,000. But it's different by different subjects. So, here are four subjects. You like my quiz before, let's have another quiz. Uh, which of these do you think had the highest number of people getting a, a graduate level job last year? Geography. You can talk amongst yourselves again. Confirm it. talking a very small number doing Spanish compared to a large number doing geography. Yeah, absolutely. There, there's certainly, when you look at this um, data, it tells you how many people right. the percentage is based on. Yeah, well, well how many, basically how many respondents there were for the survey. Because, yeah, there's certainly something at, at, at play there. But, but the point that I, I was leading towards, really, is this idea that students yeah. now go to very good universities and do all kinds of subjects and go into all kinds of different career paths. So this idea about, well, what should I study to get a good job is a, is a, is a bit more nuanced. And, uh, by that I mean, uh, if, you, if you take lots and lots of subjects out there, a sort of Russell Group and the top selective universities, 
students will study them, but then often go into a completely unrelated career path. And that isn't always a bad thing. So if, if your son or daughter doesn't actually know what they want to do in terms of a career, my advice would be, well, if they want to get a good job, they need to study a subject they enjoy at the best university they can, and that will hopefully help them get into a good graduate career. It's not always about the subject that they've read. And I'll give you an example of this. At, at Southampton, we have a, a big graduate careers fair where we get sort of um, graduate employers coming to visit us to try and recruit our students. <coughs> I spoke to a representative from PwC, PricewaterhouseCooper. They're, they're one of the biggest graduate employers in the UK. And last year, they, they, they told me, over 50% of their new intake came from non-business related backgrounds. So for them, a degree is just the starting point. And I think you see that a lot now in many graduate career paths, the mill ground and that kind of thing. Actually, it's more about getting a good degree from a good university than necessarily the subject that you have read. Now that isn't true all the time, so I, I'm, I'm not being glib here. If, if your son or daughter knows what they want to do in terms of a profession, a career path, or it's a profession that, that requires a degree related akin to it, of course they're going to have to study, study something, something like that. But, but as I say, for, for many students, really it's about studying hard now at uh, A-level, getting the best results they can, and getting into the best university that they can, because that's often why... Uh, how, how they'll go on and progress and get a good graduate career. Universities that are highly ranked, that are selective and competitive, have good links with employers and good employability uh, 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 statistics. And that's because, a bit like my Spanish example, regardless of the subject, they'll, they'll develop in students lots of skills and competencies and provide them with lots of experiences that they can apply to many different career paths. Uh, it's, it's about their, their numeracy, their literacy, their rationale, their sense of perspective, their cultural awareness, maybe their internship that they've had while they're doing their degree. Those kind of things that actually help them get a good job. Not always the subject that they've studied, per se, or, 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 or any other thing they might have done at, uh, at university. So it's getting a, getting a good degree from a good university. Now, uh, I, keep, uh, I keep using this phrase, good, good university, and I, I thought next, it might be helpful to talk about some of the different types of things that are going on with, with universities that are out there. And uh, I guess the first thing to say is it is, it is still very competitive at the top end of, of the university game. U uh, universities in the last couple of years have a greater degree of flexibility in terms of the number of offers that they can make if you're following this in the press. But uh, certainly the more selective, the more popular institution, it's still competitive. So you have more applicants than there are, are places available. And th th there's a greater amount of choice than there has ever been now. And, th and the government are pushing even more on this agenda. They want more higher education institutions, and more universities. So it's a bit of a minefield for, for students and parents, I think, na navigating all of this. And I think the solution is, what, what students have got to do really between now and, and, and September of this year is do some research and make sure that they find the right course and the right place for them. And as I say, I thought we'd better talk about some of the different types of university uh, that are out there. But I'd just like to, to preface this by saying the UK is, is still a really good place to study in and get your, your degree. Um, in, in, in the press, you, you would think there's a sort of brain drain, lots of people wanting to leave the UK to go and study in Europe and that kind of stuff. And there are some students doing that, but, but broadly speaking, the UK is still a hot place to come and get a, get a degree. Why do I say that? Well, every year there's something called the QS World Rankings, and what it does, it ranks the top 100 universities in the world and you can get this information freely online, they do have a subject as well. But what I've done is take the top 100 universities in the world and rank them by country. And uh, you can see there, if you're keeping up with me, that the, the, the USA has 30 of the top 100 universities in the world. Can, can you think of some of them? Can you name it? Yeah. 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 You got it, yes, yeah. so all the Ivy League type stuff. But uh, and USA, big country. After the USA, though, the UK has 18 of the top 100 universities in the world. What am I saying this? Well, it means we're an, we're an importer, really. We, we attract lots of students to come and study here. Many of them are, are institutions and places where um, students from this school go and study and do fantastically well. But, but, it, but it means not all universities are the same. Some are more selective, 
some are more, more competitive, and some are in different, different groups. Um, have you heard, for example, of the Russell Group? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so many students um, I meet are very keen to apply to Russell Group universities. Southampton's in the Russell Group, and uh, it's become a very good um, catch-all, actually, the, the Russell Group. Uh, should I just apply for Russell Group universities? And what, what it means, basically, is a group of 24 UK-based universities that are primarily research-intensive, research-focused, um, and offer sort of good experiences in terms of learning and teaching, but are, are quite large in terms of their income and, and their links with, 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 with business and the, and the public sector. Um, the, the thing is though, the term Russell Group I think is more famous than sometimes the universities that are in it. So um, what I thought we'd do is, is wake you up with another quiz and uh, what we're going to do is have a quick round of university challenge. Uh, what, what I thought we'd do is have a look at some universities and see if you can spot which of the following are not in the Russell Group, therefore not a sort of leading UK uni. So, so see how you get on. Which, which of the following universities here are, are not in the Russell Group? You can confer with your friends on this. Confer with your neighbours. But um, the universities in red are not in the Russell Group. Um, often when I show this slide, people are surprised about Bath, because that came in in our league table at number 10. St Andrews, where Kate and Wills went, you know, you'd think, you'd think that would be. But, but what's, what's my point here? Well, broadly speaking, there are two types, I think, of the university now. This has been very broad. And depending on what your son or daughter wants to study, I think will affect which type they want to choose. So type one are what we call research, I personally call research intensive universities. So as well as teaching students, they're doing lots of research. If, if I think about it at Southampton, we're, we're trying to find um, cures for cancer. We're writing the latest book on Shakespeare. We're trying to make the internet faster. We're, building uh, lasers that go and clean up parts of space and, and all that kind of stuff as well as, as teaching students. And what that means is if, if, if your student is wanting to do a, uh, if your son or daughter, sorry, is wanting to do a, a traditional academic subject at, at a research intensive university, they're going to be exposed to the latest sort of 21st century academic thought in their subject area. They're, they're going to be taught basically by people who aren't just reading the books, they're, they're writing the books, they're the, the sort of authority in their subject area and that institution. Um, so so that's, that's type one. Type two is what I personally call a, a regional university. And this is where the, the courses that this institution specialises in, or the subject of the course that your son or daughter wants to do, isn't so research intensive. Maybe it's more vocationally focused. So art and design, sports science, uh, radiography, social work, so lots of things that you need a degree in now but aren't necessarily so research intensive. And I think it's fair to say, let's just unpick this, I think it's fair to say if they were going for a research intensive university, it's going to be the Russell Group and some others. And uh, it's going to mean that the university will probably have a national and international reputation. It might be competitive for certain subjects. It could have high grades, and it could be based in a, in a city or a campus. And size come in, it, it comes into play here too, because um, not all universities obviously are the same size. And it, even within the Russell Group, there, there's, there's huge variation. So you get universities now of the size, say, of, of, of Manchester that have something like 40,000 students. You get smaller uh, campus-based universities like uh, Warwick or, or St Andrews or, or York that are, are, are smaller, maybe maybe 10 to 15,000 students. So what, what size university would, would feel right for your, your son or daughter? Um, 
and as I say, it's not all about research intensive universities. If, if, if they're wanting to do something that's more applied, more vocational, actually the Russell groups aren't, aren't the best place to, to look at. Uh, if they're wanting to do something where they're going to learn a specific skill or a sp specific vocation, they may want to take that out to a local community, have some sort of placement. There, there's some very, very good regional universities out there uh, too. So, so lots to think about. I, I, I hope you're following me here, but I'm, I'm going through some of the questions. City, campus, regional research, how far, what type of university, what should you study? Um, a few more things just before I, I finish. One of the things I haven't uh, expanded on is this idea about selection and grades. And, and uh, I think it's fair to say the more popular a subject, the higher the grades. Uh, grades don't always equate to quality of course. And uh, so grades aren't an indicator of how good a course is. There are other things that you can look at, and we'll, we'll come on to those in a moment. But, but it's fair to say popular subjects ask for high grades because they have lots of people applying. Conversely, you can have very good universities that want to attract more students so the grades are slightly lower, or, or they're looking to fill places. They, they want more people to study certain subjects. So some courses select, some more recruit. My point for mentioning this is it will affect, obviously, your son or daughter's application. If they're applying for very selective courses, they're probably going to have to have more than just, say, grades to get an offer. Their, their statement, their reference is going to be important. And, and, and there are some courses that are really easy to get into. But if you've been following my talk so far, it's about trying to aim high and get into the best, best places you can. So there's no point just applying for very easy, easy institutions. Um, sometimes I think... Um, students and parents don't realise how competitive it is. So uh, I thought we'd have my final game of this all. And uh, I, I thought you might like this cultural reference, um, which is Play Your Cards Right. Now, I don't know if you, you want to admit to watching Play Your Cards Right, but uh, the way it works is Bruce would hold up a card and you'd shout, oh, or, you're going to love this. So <laughs> what I thought we'd do is look at some applications to Russell Group Universities last year, and as we go down the list, you've got to guess. You, you got it, you see. So, so what I, I've tried to pick um, all universities that you'll have heard of, and uh, as I say, we're going to look at how many applications they had, and I'll tell you how many places they had to. So last year, um, Oxford, they, they had about just short of 18,000 applications for about 3,000 places. Now, what do you think, Cambridge, higher or lower? Oh, I uh, uh, you, you're slightly wrong, it was a bit lower. Uh, not, not much lower. Um, what do you think, LSE, higher or lower than Cambridge? Higher. Higher. Well done if you said higher, yes. You won a holiday. Uh, they, they had uh, 17,000 for nearly 1,600 places. Now, Southampton, where I'm from, higher or lower? Now, who said lower? <laughs> Most offended. <laughs> we, we had about 36,000, but we have a large uh, intake. York, higher or lower than Southampton? Lower. Lower, yes. Yeah. So, smaller university, about 20. Anyway, we'll be here, we'll be here all day. Let's bomb through a few. Um, Warwick, what do you think? Higher or lower than Kings? Lower. Lower, yeah. They're in, they're in about 29,000. Durham, higher or lower than Warwick? Higher. Higher. About 26, about 4,000. And, and Liverpool, down there at about 36,000. So quite a lot of applicants per places at some of these places. But that shouldn't put, obviously, your sons and daughters off applying. What, what it should maybe suggest, though, is at this point in the process, they, they need to be checking they're going to be qualified for the courses that they're applying to. So they've got time now to do some research. There's the fair happening at 4 o'clock. Lots of universities will be there. And students need to be thinking about, well, what grades do I need? What are the entry requirements? What's the selection process? Um, am I going to need more than just the, the prerequisites to get on the course? So I take something like medicine at Southampton. We have about 250 places. This year we've had about 3,500 people apply. All the students have predicted the grades, so we actually have to look at their statement, their, their UK CAT, which is a separate admissions test. So there's all these kind of things that students really need to be swatting up, up on at the moment, so they can put in a, a competitive application. Also, they can be looking at all of the courses that are out there, because one of the nice things about universities, you don't just have to do something you've done at A-level. And uh, here on the screen are, are the subjects that we kind of cover at Southampton. But I put in bold some of the things that you can't take at A-level. So if, if they're good at maths and physics, but they don't want to do that at a degree, maybe, maybe 
as a degree. Have a look at engineering. Uh, if they like very much the physical side of the sciences, have a look at oceanography or uh, um, environmental science or, or that kind of thing. So there are lots and lots of things you can do at the university beyond your, your A-level qualifications if, if you can't find a subject. Uh, what else was I going to say? Um, it, it's not just about choosing the course either. So one of the things that students find hard is differentiating between different places. And I think you can get a bit more savvy by looking at the accommodation, the facilities, um, the social life. You know, will they find someone to love them? Um, can, you do, can you do something else with your degree? So can you have an internship? Can you spend part of the course studying abroad? So at, at Southampton, we send about five, 600 students abroad for part of their course to study at universities all over the world. Can, can you do that at other institutions? So lots and lots of, of things to, to help students choose. Um, really, it's about doing the research. So I just thought I'd end with a, with a couple of slides about places you as parents might want to have a look at. And they're all really online. So um, there's the, 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 the league tables, there's the UCAS website, and then the Wits University site. We'll, we'll, we'll take them in turn. So, and most of the major league, league tables now have been produced for the 2017 entry. There's lots of them, and uh, they all measure different things. But I think at subject level, they can be very useful, whatever the top 20, top 30 places. There's the Guardian, the Times, the Complete University Guide, the THE. And it's worth having a look at each of them respectively and, and, and seeing where the subject falls. But uh, students have access to these uh, here in the sixth form, and they're all, you know, at the swipe of your thumb on the, on the phone. Um, there's also the UCAS website, which is where students will have to apply <coughs> to university through. That, that has a lot of great information on there for parents and students as a separate parents and guardian section. Talks about the process, talks about different types of course, helps you search and find courses. They have a course search. Um, but an even better site, I think, is, is the which university website. And it's, I, I chatted to somebody the other day about it and, it, and we were saying it's a bit like TripAdvisor <laughs> for universities. And the, the reason I say that is you can type in the subject that you want to study. So I typed in here the other day I wanted to do medicine and it finds you all of the courses and then you can select a few and compare and contrast them. And, and it gives you lots of little bite, like TripAdvisor, like lots of little bite-sized information. So what students thought, employment, accommodation costs, um, average available point score to get in, so, so you can do quite a nice little compare and contrast. So have a look at the which uni site. Um, finally, check, check the modular estimation. So um, one, one of the things I think students often forget to do, they look at grades and they look at the league table, but they don't always look actually what they're going to study each year. And I think parents can help sometimes with this. And universities now will publish what they're going to take each year, each, each term of, of, of the degree. So this is a little screen grab from history at Southampton. Now we have a very broad history course, but uh, we do uh, Romans right up to modern social political history. But it, it's different, obviously, at, different, at each institution. And if the modular information suggests it's not stuff that your son or daughter is going to be interested in, then maybe they ought to discount that course. So do, do have a look at, uh, at the modular information. They've got to find, between now and September, five courses to apply for. Um, for medicine, veterinary science, dentistry, it's, it's four. For Oxbridge, they've got to only apply to one, so Oxford or Cambridge. And uh, they've got to get their application form off by October. But for everybody else, they've got to find five places to apply to from September and get their application form off by January. Having said that, that's a date that this school doesn't recognise. They'll expect most students to have their a UCAS online application form off really by, by uh, I would say, what, November of this year, November time. So really not that, not that far away. And then what happens is students will start getting offers from the places they've applied to. If they want to have a gap year, they can apply this year and defer their place. Um, and there are other routes in. But, but So it's five, five places. Nobody knows where you apply to. It's all anonymous. So if you remember applying yourself and listing on your UCAS form, and that, you don't do that now. And then once they've got their offers in, they have to have a firm and an insurance choice. So, so to leave you with, with two final slides, really, now is the time to start doing the research. Um, so maybe this, this summer you can do your university tour of Great Britain and uh, get round to the Open Days. There's a very helpful website called opendays.com. 
and that it, it has every university opening day listed on it to save you trawling through them all. And then as soon as students come back into year 13 or upper sixth or whatever you call it here, they'll have to complete their application and move to the next part of the process. So that's interviews, open days, deciding on firm choice, that sort of thing. So it feels a long way away, but it'll, it'll happen quite, the whole process will really ramp up and happen quite quickly. I, I think that's quite enough uh, from me, so I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there. I'll, I'll just end with one plug for Southampton. If you want to come and have a visit, <laughs> we've got some open days uh, in, in July and September on Saturdays and Sundays. And I'll be next door at the exhibition if you want to come and chat to me about Southampton. But otherwise, thank you very much for listening and, and good luck with this whole process. The EPQ, I don't know if you've heard of this extended part, um, it's, it's, uh, it's now the ninth most taken A level. It's, it's become a huge success. And uh, the reason it's become such a, a, a good success when AQA set it up is it helps students in the, the second year of A level develop a lot of skills that they can apply to uh, the first year of an undergraduate course, mainly in independent research. And the uh, universities have cottoned onto this and have seen that students who take an EPQ transition very well to that first year of of undergraduate study. So much so that many universities now will take the EPQ grade into consideration when, when students apply. So the easiest way of explaining it is if, if you take something like, and, and lots of universities do this, so Southampton, we, we ask for two A's and a B for history, you've got to have an A in your history, but, but if you get a good grade in your EPQ, we'll make you an alternate offer of ABB with an A in your EPQ. So it's sort of become quite a handy currency, <laughs> for want of a better expression, for, for applying to universities. At my university, it's not a problem. We, we still m make most of the offer based on GCSE grades, personal statement, and predicted grades from, from the school or college. This idea about an AS, yes, we did have students presenting to us with an AS, and that they, they were, you know, it was an indicator of their ability at that point in time. But we still only, uh, we still make conditional offers at, at my institution based on their final, final grades. And we're quite used to students applying to us with other subjects from other countries who don't have an AS. So, so we're, we're pretty, pretty sanguine about it, pretty upbeat. Um, some universities, and there's, it's really a couple, uh, LSE, Cambridge, I think King's, they're, they're still looking for the AS. But, we, but most universities are pretty comfortable that students are going to be applying for that AS and they're going to use other, other criteria to, to make an offer. And most, most schools, most students are in the same boat. I think there's a lot of bad advice actually in schools about what a personal statement is and uh, really it's, it's down to two things. Why do they want to study the subject and what makes them the right person for the course? And uh, I think really 70% of their four paragraphs should be about the course and what they've done to, to widen their interest in history as, a, as an example. And, and often students who, who don't write very persuasive offers or, or, or struggle to get into this and stuff haven't talked enough about course content. And, and I think it can sometimes be a problem in, for students in really good schools like this where there's lots of great extracurricular activities, they're captaining the football team, they're doing D of E, and actually most of their statement is about that kind of stuff, which is great in terms of character and, and, uh, and transferable skills, but there isn't enough content about course. So my, my advice would be try and get as much information about preparedness for the, for the course that will win you more favours than, than, than some of the extracurricular stuff, which is nice, but stick that in love with that. Some universities will not be interested at all in personal statements. They're just looking at grades. Of the five you apply to, you only write one personal statement uh, for, for, for the last couple of five. So, you, yeah, you, you might have some that disregard it, some that use it a lot. If I, if I give you like geology at Southampton, we interview, um, when we sit the students down, the first thing we, we chat to them is, is stuff they put in their personal statement. But they might apply for another place that doesn't look at it, so it's, it's a bit of a, yes, it's a bit of a, a bit of an issue. But does it tend to be the ones that call you for interview, for the extra interview concept? Yes, often, yeah, yeah. often at interview, yeah. And, and students must be prepared to talk about it. I see it in sometimes on the medicine interviews and it's, it's, it's knee gnawingly cringe, you know, when they talk about something they've done and you start to unpick it and, and it's, 
made up. So. <laughs>